Good morning to you, and as always, let me start by welcoming you, one and all, to our worship of God here this Sunday morning at Gilcomson Church. Delighted to welcome those of you who are visiting, those of you here for the first time. Uh, we are genuinely delighted to see you, to welcome you. Hope you've already received a warm welcome and that you will enjoy sharing with us in our worship of God. We gather simply to bring our praise to the living God, to uh, seek his presence among us, and we trust that you will know that and be able to rejoice in that. A warm welcome to those of you joining us online as well. We don't ever forget about yourselves. I'm glad that you have that facility and are able to join us in this way. We would love to have you here in the building itself, but recognize that uh, for a whole variety of reasons that may not be possible. So a warm welcome to you, and uh, we pray that the Lord would uh, use this worship to be a means of grace for you also. Um, you'd maybe have seen on the notices that uh, we do have a, a number of copies of the book More to the Story that was flagged up in, in the loop this past week. Um, if you'd like a copy, it's at the discounted price of £7, and we, we have uh, a number of copies of that available if you would like that. And a reminder, too, that uh, there is a date in March, March the 17th, Sunday, March the 17th, when there will be the opportunity for those who are uh, of a mind to uh, join the church, to become members here. And if you'd like to think in those terms, then do speak to myself or one of the elders at the end. Let's then join with one another to worship God and sound out his praise in the words of one of the Psalms, O oh, come and let us to the Lord, let us worship God. bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Living God, uh, we, we would, uh, albeit metaphorically, we would get down on our knees before yourself. We would bow low in spirit before the majesty of your own being. You are the almighty God, all wise, everlasting, 
infinite in all the attributes that are yours and perfect in them all as well. And we're glad about that, glad that this is your world, that you made it, you run it, you care for it, and in that love you have come to it in the person of Jesus, your Son. We thank you that you've not left us in the dark about yourself, but you've made it clear who you are, what you're like, how you work, and made it clear too for us that you are indeed the sovereign God. You have a purpose that runs from one end of eternity to the other, and you are sovereignly working out that purpose and none can stand against that. We're glad of that because all that you do, all that you say, all that you plan is good. And we are glad in the knowledge that you are so very wise. You know each and every one of us in the mystery of that, uh, that wisdom and that knowledge that is yours. We couldn't even begin to measure that knowledge that you have of us. But you know and understand every smallest detail about each and every one of us. And we're glad about that. Glad in the knowledge that there's nothing that we can hide from you, that you know our circumstances, you know our feelings, you know the problems that we face, the worries that we have, the dreams that we we cherish. We thank you, living God, that in your love for us, you have come to us in the person of your Son, intent in him upon addressing the deepest needs that we have and doing what we ourselves singularly fail to do, by providing for us a life that was lived in the person of your Son in perfect obedience, a life that was radiant with your own righteousness. And we marvel to think that he, the one who never deserved at all the condemnation of a holy God, should stand in our place and take upon himself the consequences of our lack of that righteousness. We want to thank you as we gather for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for all that he's accomplished, all that's been offered to us in him. That forgiveness that you declare is absolutely comprehensive, covering everything past, present, and future that has been wrong in our lives. And we thank you that in him you give to us a clean slate, you make us new people, you open to us a whole new future lived in the new power of your own Holy Spirit resting upon your people. And so it is in his name that we gather, intent upon bringing to you the worship and the adoration of our hearts, eager to know your presence with us, your speaking to us, and asking simply that we may know the help of your Holy Spirit that he would give us understanding of your word, that he would stir in our hearts that praise of your great name, and that we might have our ears wide open to all that you are keen to say to us this morning. Meet with us, we pray. Help us in our worship. May it be to your own praise and glory as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Great, we're going to read from the Bible, and uh, Rose is going to come and read for us the passage, and you'll find the words on the screen. Good morning. The reading this morning is Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. You'll find that in a church Bible if you picked one up, or on your phone if that's how you like to access your Bible. So Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Amen. Great. Thank you, Rosie. Um, now, we're going to have a, a little think about that, uh, that particular passage there. And uh, what he's on about is simply this. How many of you, girls and boys, how many of you would be able to tell me some things that are definitely wrong. Yeah, 
at least one can tell me there are some things that are definitely wrong. Uh, this is not inquisition. I'm not going to kind of come down in here like a ton of bricks and say, well, now you, you've kind of uh, confessed up and that sort of thing. Uh, some of the things that might be wrong. What would be wrong, Matthew? Murder, okay. Um, let's, let's just kind of have a show of hands as to, to kind of how many uh, actually figure out that this is. Um, if you are in this building and you have a hand that you are able to raise in the air, and that may not be everyone, um, would you raise a hand if you think that murder is definitely wrong? Okay, yep. I'm, I'm kind of looking out for the ones that haven't got their hands up just to know who to avoid at the end of the service, okay. Um, right, so, so murder, we, we kind of figure that's definitely wrong. How about, uh, yeah, Luke? Stealing, okay. Right, uh, again, let's, let's kind of have a show of hands. If you think that stealing from someone else, things that don't belong to you but uh, belong to someone else, uh, if you think that is definitely wrong, put your hand up. Okay, slightly fewer hands. So um, just watch your property. Um, if you have a bag with you or anything like that today, um, just check that you've still got it and um, that sort of thing. And if you find the person next door, just putting a kind arm around you, just kind of double check they're not putting the arm in the pocket and things like that. Okay, so um, we've got kind of murder, definitely wrong, and stealing, definitely wrong. Any others that are kind of definitely wrong, Matthew? Uh, Sam? Lying, okay, uh, by which you mean not kind of lying down to go to sleep, but uh, telling a lie. Uh, hands up, you think that lying is wrong. And that's probably going to be less here because some people are going to think, yeah, you know, maybe there's sometimes that a little white lie is not going to do too much harm, okay. But we would recognize, we would recognize there are certain things that are wrong. And, and when someone does that, we would kind of, uh, if they, they kind of, we knew that, um, we had, uh, you know, seen this person actually stealing what didn't belong to them, we would probably point the finger at them. Um, say, say I was the one that, that I'd done the stealing, okay? Um, you would point the finger at me. Let me see you do that. If I, if I, have, if I have stolen something, um, say, you know, I, I'd kind of, you'd see me ransacking the offering bowl at the, at the back and, and pinching all the stuff, and, and you think, the guy's got a lot in his pockets this morning, you know, that, that's, that's taken from there. Um, you might say, you're absolutely right. That's what you're doing. You're pointing at me, and you're saying, hey, you know, you're the guy, and, and that's worrying because the finger now is pointing at me, um, and it's probably on the screen, you're thinking it's pointing at me as well. Um, and yes, that's what we do. We, we kind of point the finger. I'm very reluctant to do it because um, you're going to take this personally. So um, that's what we do. We point the finger at someone and say, hey, you, you know, you, uh, have you ever had that at school? Do your teacher ever point the finger at you and say, um, you, uh, um, uh, you haven't done your homework. Anyone ever had that sort of thing? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Some of the grown-ups, at least, uh, you know, it's a dim and distant past, a, a painful recollection. It happens, yeah, the teacher kind of pinpoints you and says, you, uh, you. Uh, sometimes to ask you to do something, sometimes because you've done something wrong and the finger gets pointed at you. And when, when you look at the finger pointing, that's what Paul is on about. He said, we do that because we, we can recognize some things are just wrong, uh, whether it's lying or stealing or murder or um, uh, being greedy or shouting at someone else or hitting someone else. And we'd say, you know, that's, that's not the way we behave. And so we would point the finger uh, because we recognize that it's wrong. And uh, when you point the finger, and we'll show you the next little picture here, when you point the finger at, your, at someone else, what you find is three fingers are actually pointing back at you, right? Do that. You point the finger at me, all right? Point the finger at me, and yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah I can see your three fingers are, are pointing back at you. And that's what Paul is saying. At the moment you can recognize in someone else that something is wrong, and you're pointing the finger at them, um, Three fingers are pointing back to you and saying, yeah, you probably do the same sort of thing as well. And you probably have told a lie. Now, I'm not going to kind of uh, make this too awkward for us, but I'm just suggesting that uh, you, you can recognize that when someone tells you a lie, you are kind of upset and annoyed and angry. And yet the very fact that you can recognize it is, is probably pretty much proving that yeah, you, you recognize that because you've done that, and you know what a lie is. And that really is what Paul is on about here, saying um, you can point the finger to other people, but at the same time, you've got to recognize the finger gets pointed at you as well, because uh, his opening line there was, and you can see it on the screen, you therefore have no excuse. The moment you start pointing the finger at someone else, 
um, you are recognizing that, yeah, the finger gets pointed at us as well. And that really is the point that he's wanted to make here, that uh, all of us, no matter who we are, no matter how good we may think we are, no matter how good we are compared to some other people, uh, all of us are needing God's forgiveness because all of us have gone wrong in our lives. And and that's why um, the Bible points us to Jesus, because in him, the Bible says, in him, there's forgiveness. He gives us a new start. He's able to, to, to kind of take all the wrong things that get pinned against us. They got pinned against him when he was crucified on the cross. He was bearing the punishment. He was bearing the penalty. And uh, as a result, all the stuff that otherwise would get pinned against us got pinned against him. And so no longer is it pinned against us. We're able to be forgiven, able to make a new start and do so in God's strength and help. So I thought this morning before you head off to Sunday school, we would sing a song that um, reminds us of that, all the, the kind of bad things that there are in all of our lives, no matter who we are, um, uh, God cares for us and God has made a provision for us in Jesus and uh, <clears throat> does so because he, he cares for us. And so the, the kind of opening line of the song, uh, I'm special, is not, hey, you know, I'm special because I'm really good, but not... I'm special because I'm really bad, and yet God has has been pleased to do something for me to meet me in my need. So let's join to sing this. I'm so I'm special. Uh, before you head off to Sunday school. Let's uh, turn now to join in prayer again as we bring our thanks to God and as we lay before him the different needs, the different burdens that we have. Let's join in prayer. Living God, uh, we're glad always of the opportunity simply to pause in what sometimes are very busy lives lives where we are easily distracted by all the different tasks that we have to do, all the different schedules that we have to keep, 
all the different problems that we face. And sometimes we don't have the time or the opportunity simply to pause and once again to reflect on all your goodness towards us and to be reminded again of all that you have done for us in the person of your Son and to be reminded as well that behind that is indeed the love that you declare you have. You loved the world, you declare so much that you sent your own beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in such a manner that whoever should believe in him, you declare, should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And we will never be able to quantify just how much it cost him to secure that for us, but we're glad to rest in the knowledge that it was done out of a love that is constant, a love that is unwavering and unwearying, and a love that is not conditional upon our performance and upon our measuring up. And we praise you for that. And how we thank you for the multitude of different ways in which in the midst of all our varying circumstances, through all the rough and difficult patches in our experience, as well as through all the good times, you prove yourself to be in your grace more than sufficient for our every need. We thank you, living God, for the assurance you give to us in your scriptures that whoever makes you their dwelling place, then your faithfulness, that constant love and commitment that you have to your people, your faithfulness is like a shield and a rampart so that we are protected. Even through the difficult times, even through adversity, you're there to sustain us, to help us, to strengthen us, to comfort us, to encourage us, to bear with us the burdens of our living. We praise you gladly, living God, that you do indeed sustain your people day by day. You carry our burdens for us and with us day by day. And in your Son have provided for us that which meets our very deepest needs. We are very conscious, living God, of how frail our humanity is and indeed how flawed our humanity is as well. How easily we go astray, how easily we offend others, how easily we occasion hurt and harm, how easily we are tempted and succumb to temptation and act and speak and think in ways that become harmful and damaging for others and are themselves an affront to your own perfect being. We pray, living God, for those who are thus damaged and hurt and whose lives an experience has been scarred by the conduct of others, by the words perhaps that they've spoken, by the things that they have done, by the way in which, by their very attitudes, relationships have been soured and spoiled. We pray that you would draw near to all such according to their need. Needs very often known ultimately only to yourself. We pray that you would draw near to them to be their strength, to be their comfort, and to grant your gracious healing and help. And we thank you, living God, that in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you, you have set in place that which will issue one day in our being fully and finally healed, free at last, not only from the presence of sin, not only from the power and the guilt of sin, but from all the repercussions of sin in our experience and in our lives. And how we long for that day, living God, when at last 
we shall be made whole. We pray, Lord God, for those who are laid aside with illness, those who are in hospital or those recovering at home after surgery, very aware this past week of how easily and quickly accidents can happen and hurt can be occasioned, bones can be broken, dislocation can come into play. We pray, Lord God, for your watch over all who find themselves either ill or laid aside at this time. Be with them, be with their families, granting that they may know and be conscious of your presence with them in their present circumstances at this time. We're very aware too, living God, that we are very mortal. Life is very short, and none of us know how long or indeed how short a time we have. We're simply conscious that there is that mortality about us. And we praise you and thank you that in your Son you have broken the hold that death has upon your people. That in his resurrection from the dead you've guaranteed to us that we too who trust in him shall share in that resurrection to eternal life at the last. So that we have not only your word for it but the demonstration in the person of Jesus, that what you have promised, you are indeed able and pleased to fulfill in the experience of your people. And we pray for all, therefore, who mourn the passing of loved ones at this time, that you would comfort them in their sorrow, and that you would grant to them in the knowledge of your risen Son that great surging hope in their hearts. And what we recognize, living God, within ourselves in terms of our being both frail and flawed, we recognize too is played out on the canvas of communal life as well. The fragility of communal life in nations and between nations. And the way in which through conflict, through oppression, through cruelty, through disasters that uh, are uh, occasioned one way and another in our world. There are so many who suffer hugely in our world. It grieves us and vexes us, living God, when we get some small sense of how wretched the experience of so many must be, whether in poverty, abject poverty, in the absence of food, the lack of any water in the immediate vicinity, the wretched conditions in which so many must live, whether in the context of persecution as one group of people use their power to oppress and harm and damage others, or whether in the context of open conflict and so many millions caught up in such arenas of conflict and traumatized, left desolate, their lives, their communities, their cities, left devastated as a consequence of such war. We, we can only cry out to you, living God, and beseech you, please, look with mercy upon this broken world. And as the judge of all the earth, who you declare always does that which is right, we ask, please, that you would sovereignly intervene in such a manner that there may be an end to such conflicts. Resolutions may be found that bring about a peace that where there is oppression, you would indeed be pleased so to deal rightly with oppressors, that those who have been oppressed might know a freedom from such cruel subjection, and that those countless many who suffer on the wake of one form of disaster or another throughout our world might know relief as you prosper the labors 
of those who throughout the world seek to bring such respite and relief to them. God, have mercy upon us, we pray you, and grant that as we ourselves seek to learn from your word, you would be pleased by your spirit to teach us from your word in such a manner that our lives thus shaped by yourself through your spirit and by your word may indeed themselves be instruments increasingly of your gracious dealings with those around us in the smaller world in which each of us lives. Hear us then in these our prayers we ask, Father, and all the unspoken prayers of our hearts as we ask them all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, before we turn to the Word of God, we'll use the words of our next hymn as a prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Uh, we sang there at the end of uh, one of those early verses, um, Grand Lord, that I may magnify thy name, and um, translated, I suppose, into more modern contemporary language. Um, that really is the desire of our hearts, that uh, uh, you would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to commend Jesus. We want you to discover for yourself how good he is, how great he is, the life that he gives to you, and to help you to see why it is that you need Jesus, and how ready he is to be for you all that you need him to be. And that really is the motivation behind what the Apostle Paul is on about. It's the motivation behind the whole of the Bible that's presented to us so that you and I might be introduced to this person, Jesus, whose life is so very fully recorded for us, who lived an astonishing life, died that dreadful death, is now risen from the dead, alive and at work in the world today, someone that you and I may know and someone that you and I are bidden to come to know ourselves, and uh, <clears throat> the whole Bible pointing us to him and to our need of him. 
Um, Jesus told in one of the most famous stories that he told, a story that we know wrongly as the story of the, the prodigal son. Um, it's, it's wrongly termed that because it's not only about the prodigal son, it's about the other son as well. It's this man who had two sons, and one of the sons went way off piste. Um, just, you know, grabbed a hold of all the money that he could get from his dad, went off, did his own thing, lived a pretty reckless, pretty wanton, wild life, uh, partying here, partying there, uh, going totally astray, making a total mess of things. And uh, he comes back, he's the prodigal son, by the way, in the story. And when he gets back, the other son who's been at home and been a kind of good boy the whole time and has helped out in the, uh, the, the family farm all the time, uh, he is just offended by the way in which the father welcomes this other guy back. You know, um, he doesn't even refer to him as my brother. He says, your son, you know, and, and why are you thus uh, welcoming him back when he's squandered your resources, wasted your money like that? He is just a waster. And uh, Jesus told the story to help us see and help the folk uh, at the, the, the time he was speaking, help them to see why it is that not only does the younger son, the prodigal son, need forgiveness, but the older son is as screwed up in a very different way as the younger son. Both of them need him. And, and it's really that that Paul, in the passage that uh, we're going to look at this morning, in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, it's really that that he's on about. In chapter 1, the latter part of chapter 1, he's, he's kind of run through a whole catalog of things. And it's quite easy for us to kind of uh, stand back from it and say, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty bad, that's pretty bad. Towards the end of chapter 1, he instances a whole load of stuff. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slander as God, hate as insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. No understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And they think, well, yeah. And, and we kind of look around and think, yeah, you know, that's, that's pretty much true of our society today. And uh, we can see, like the, the, the girls and boys were saying, uh, you want to put your hand up? Yeah, we can see envy, it's wrong. Murder, it's wrong. Strife, it's wrong. Slander, gossip, the lot, it's wrong. We, we know that, appreciate that, and are quite ready to point the finger and say, yeah, I, I can understand why they have no excuse. Um, they've got it coming to them, and yeah, if anyone needs forgiveness, certainly they do as well. So Paul then, at the start of chapter 2, pitches in to those who are a little bit like the older brother, saying, you know, these guys, uh, they're like the prodigal son. They've just kind of gone totally off piste and, uh, and lived, wasted, rotten lives like that. Uh, why on earth are you dealing with them like that? He, he then turns the finger and points it, as it were, to them. You, therefore, um, O man, is, is what it says in the original, meaning by that not just men, uh, but human beings, uh, you therefore have no excuse. And he's using exactly the same word as he'd used in chapter 1, verse 20, where he says, so that uh, people are without excuse. He's saying, yeah, um, you are equally without excuse. And uh, he goes on to say, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same thing the moment. Uh, in other words, um, you, you start judging someone else. Um, you, are, you are demonstrating two things. Number one, you recognize some things are right and some things are wrong. That, that's on a basis which you can pass any sort of judgment because you recognize some things are right, some things are wrong. You say, oh, fair enough, yep, um, that's the case. That's the first thing you demonstrate the moment you, you start judging someone else. The second thing that you demonstrate is your familiarity with the thing that you are judging. You recognize in others, most readily, traits that are there in yourself, except in other people, they just look uglier than it looks in yourself. You kind of excuse yourself when uh, um, you, you, you yeah, think of, of what's going on in your own life, but because these are traits in your own heart and life, you do tend to recognize them most readily in others. So if you're a, you're a kind of proud person, you don't like other people who are proud because those other people who are proud kind of 
make you feel a little bit less than you, you think you really are. And so you, you recognize the pride in others more readily if, if that's a trait in your own heart. You recognize those who are envious more readily if envy is a part and parcel of your own life. And that really is what Paul is on about. He's, he's really underlining what Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 1 of, the, of Matthew's gospel. Start of the, um, the, the chapter there, Jesus says, do not judge uh, lest you also be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. So what he's on about here is um, the, the kind of self-righteous way in which we're able to identify things in other people that mean they are liable uh, to be judged by God because there's a whole load of stuff in their lives that is just wrong. So what he's on about now in these 16 verses is the judgment of God. And the extent of that judgment of God that encompasses each and every one of us. Whether you are more like the prodigal son or the older son, doesn't matter. All alike are without excuse before the living God. Now, bear in mind, his purpose in so doing is, is not to make us feel bad but rather to help us to see why it is that no matter who you are, you need the Lord Jesus. Because he was aware in Rome, as we're aware presumably today as well, that it's tempting for us to think that because I'm actually, I'm quite a nice guy, really. Um, I am pretty respectable. You know, I kind of put a tie on a Sunday morning. I, I dress in a, in a reasonably um, formal sort of manner like that. I, I, I kind of, I, I know the, the kind of way the thing works, and, and I, I make an effort, and uh, I'm a, a good neighbor, you know, and I'll put the bins out, and I'll put the neighbor's bins out as well. I recycle, um, you know, and I'll maybe even, you know, give a little bit of money to this charity and that money uh, to another charity, maybe to kind of save the whales and, and, and all sorts of stuff in my life that I can point to. Um, I, I don't really swear profusely. Um, I, I don't kind of go around bashing people when I don't get my own way. Um, I, I try and be reasonably kind. I'll pick up the litter on the street a little bit like that, and I'll try not to put any litter down. And, and so there's a whole long catalog of stuff. I'm a pretty good guy, really. And uh, we, we kind of think to ourselves that, therefore, I should be okay before God. If you put most folk on the spot, um, <clears throat> as it were, out there in the street and say, you know, you, you think you're going to go to heaven? What's, what's the basis in which you think you're going to go to heaven? Their answer, almost invariable, be, because I'm, I'm basically a good guy. That's why. You know, I'm a good neighbor. I'm kind, thoughtful, considerate. I don't do too much of the bad things. Everything in moderation and so on. And, and that's why I'm going to heaven. Now, Paul wants to knock that out of the head and say, um, it doesn't wash. And so he has here in these verses from verse 2 round to verse 16, he has four important truths to underline about the judgment of God. Remember, uh, the gospel, the good news, and it is good news because God has provided for us in Jesus what we don't have ourselves. The good news reveals the righteousness of God. Chapter 1, verse 17. A righteous God, he made the world, he runs the world, and he is altogether righteous. And that righteous God has righteous requirements, and that righteous God must therefore deal in a righteous judgment. And that righteous God is rightly angry or full of wrath against all that is lacking in righteousness, all that is out of line with his way of doing things. That's chapter one, the, the latter part. And so from the wrath of God, he now goes on to the judgment of God. And the first thing that he has to say in verse uh, two is that it's true. Um, it is based on truth. Verse 2, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. 
So verses uh, 2, 3, and 4, he is, he is pressing home this. God's judgment is true. And uh, there are three things that he says, verse 2, 3, 4, three things that he says in relation to this. The first of which is, don't think that God doesn't read between the lines. God's judgment is based on the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Most of us figure subconsciously that when we get to heaven, as it were, and have our cause to plead, we will be able to present something like the sort of eulogy which we hope will be read at our funeral. Now, by and large, when you go to a funeral, the eulogy touches on the good things about a person's life. You know, we're sad, we're upset, it's a, a sorrow for us to, to lose a loved one, and, and we're not running through a catalogue you know, the, the way that the person behaved in that situation. I could tell you a story about that and another situation where they told an outright lie. Another situation where they just lost the rag completely. We don't hear that at a funeral service. It's, it's a kind of eulogy. And it's, oh, we think, well, a lot of good things about the person. I didn't know that about them. I didn't know that about them either. And, and it becomes that eulogy. And um, we, we kind of mentally have this notion that somehow uh, it'll be our eulogy ideally composed by ourselves that we're able to kind of present before the Lord and, and he, will, he will just take that eulogy and think, well, yeah, pretty good guy. Um, uh, in you come like that. Uh, what Paul is saying is, no, God, God reads between the lines um, in the way that an, an employer <laughs> will read between the lines of a reference. I don't know, references are a kind of awkward thing sometimes to write, particularly because you know that the person about whom the reference is being given has the opportunity to read what you've written. So an employer might say as part of the reference, we were fortunate to have this guy working for us. And you can take that two ways. You know, either it was a, a great privilege to have this person working for us or oh, hey, if you ever managed to get this guy to work for you, you are doing pretty well. You are pretty lucky to get this guy working for you. And, and so an employer is going to read that and is going to try and read between the lines. What, what is actually being said here? Is the guy being commended as, uh, you know, this is the, the kind of best thing since sliced bread that we're going to have here? Or uh, are we getting flagged up some potential problems? Is, is this guy just kind of lazy and we're going to have to work hard to um, work, uh, get him working? Um, so God doesn't read, um, don't think that God doesn't read between the lines. He does. He knows the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, which includes not only the stuff that we leave out of the eulogy, but all the stuff that even those who are composing a full picture wouldn't really know because it's, it's inside our attitudes, our thoughts. God knows the lot. Um, and that's what Paul is on about in verse 2. Verse 3, he is going on to say, don't think that because you're better than others, you will be okay. Uh, so when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, you think you will escape God's judgment? Now, the person who is um, basically just a kind of moralist who, who is basing their hope and the conviction that actually I'm not bad, is saying I'm not bad by comparison with a whole load of other people that uh, he or she can point the finger at. We kind of look around and, and we can see a whole load of people maybe whose lives are, are, are just lived in a totally wanton way and we compare ourselves to them and we, we have this notion that somehow um, God is going to be like the kind of exam board. And getting into heaven is, is going to be a little bit like that. It's the, the kind of top 50% that, that are going to make the grade and, and get in. And, and, and that's how the selection is given. And as long as you're kind of in the top 50%, or, or maybe if, you know, if God's in a generous day, the, the top 60%, um, as long as we can kind of look around and figure that, yeah, I, I'm probably in that bracket in the, the kind of top 50%, I should be okay. Um, Paul says, no. You may not be quite as bad a liar as some of the, the rotten uh, 
con individuals are who uh, engage in all sorts of scams that mean that people are robbed of uh, tens of thousands of pounds. You may look at that aghast and say, oh, it's dreadful, how dreadful. Uh, you may not be as bad a liar, but you've got to put your hand up and say, I don't tell any lies at all. Um, that's what Paul is on about. Don't, don't think that because you can, you can identify something that is clearly and manifestly wrong in someone else, and, and you don't do that sort of thing, that you're also not a liar yourself. When you see someone who is clearly greedy, grasping, you've got to honestly put your hand up and say, I, I am never greedy. When you see someone who is behaving or speaking selfishly, you're going to put your hand up and say, I'm, I'm never selfish. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, be perfect as God himself is perfect. Um, you read that and you think, really? Um, no one's perfect. To which Jesus says, yeah, you got it. That's your problem. No one is perfect. That, that's what Paul is talking about. No one is perfect. So that's verse 3. Don't think that because you're better than others, you'll be okay. Verse 4 takes it one stage further and says, don't think that because God has not stepped in already... Uh, that it doesn't really matter. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? There's a verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, uh, where the, the writer says, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. You kind of figure, well, can't be that bad because I've, I've kind of got away with it. There's, there's not been a thunderbolt coming down from heaven that has knocked me and blasted me out of, out of his universe like that. I, I will get away with it. And, and that's just the patience of God designed to, to lead us, to give us room to move towards that place of repentance, that place where we, we have that change of mind and, and learn to place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and embrace him as our savior. That's, that's why there is that, that kindness, that forbearance, that patience on the part of God. And Paul is saying, don't think that because God is patient, it doesn't matter. Not at all. God means that we, we should turn and have the time uh, to turn to him. Verses 5 to 11, which uh, we didn't get on to read in the scripture passage this morning, but we'll read now, verses 5 to 11, moves on. Um, not only is the judgment of God true, it's based on truth, but it's also right. Verses 5 to 11. Um, first of all, verse 5. But uh, because of your stubbornness, and your unrepentant heart, you, the moralist, are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. What he's saying here is this, uh, and there are, again, three subheadings to, to this major heading, it is right, God's judgment. First of all, don't think that your upright living will see you through uh, a common perspective that we easily adopt, that somehow because I am a pretty upright, respectable, clean living sort of individual, I should be okay. You may be okay in terms of the way that you live out your life. You may be upright. You may be one who is careful never to exceed the speed limit. You may be careful not to drop litter. You may be careful to be kind to your neighbors. You may be someone who recycles on a very thorough and constant uh, basis. You may be someone who is upright and respectable. But your refusal to respond to God's word with repentance when he tells you that you need his forgiveness, your refusal to recognize and acknowledge your need of God's grace, when he has come in the person of his son of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to secure for you at 
an enormous cost, that forgiveness which is found in Emma alone, your refusal to acknowledge your need of that, and your refusal to honor God's own beloved Son who has effected that for us when he has been attested to you and to the world by God himself, as Peter says in Acts chapter 2, attested by God. This is the one who is the alone Savior. When you refuse to acknowledge God's word that tells you you need repentance, when you refuse to acknowledge your need of God's grace, when he has secured that at such cost, and when you refuse to honor God's Son, don't think that you're being upright evades the heinousness of what God says is sin. It's not your upright living in that manner that incurs God's wrath. It's your refusal to hear, heed, and accept God's word, acknowledge your need of God's grace, and your refusal to honor God's Son when he has attested clearly, manifestly, this is my beloved Son, and in him is life and forgiveness. And so God's judgment is right because of your stubbornness, your stubborn refusal to think that you can actually get through life and get through the judgment of God on the basis of your own living. When God himself has said, it doesn't wash. Verse 6 and verses 6 to 8. Don't think that the Lord is taken in by your profession of faith or your piety. Verse 6, God will repay each person according to what they've done. A direct quote from the scripture. That's the basic principle that is mirrored scarily in the words of Jesus. The end of the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that's the profession of faith. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. And you think, well, that's, that's, that's uh, a bit harsh, you know. Um, I, I have professed faith. I've stood at the front of a church building. I professed faith. I've said Jesus is Lord. I, I professed faith, and I have been serving the church in all sorts of different ways. Uh, I have been seeking to invest my time and my energies in doing good and helping others and so on and so forth, and, and as a good kind of loyal Christian, surely. And, uh, and he says, yeah, but but I'm Lord, and you're not embraced my will and done what I've called you to do. You, you may have been doing all sorts of things, may have been serving in all sorts of different ways, but, but if you're not doing what he says, living as he calls you to live, then I'm, we don't know each other. By this, our love for him is, is known that we obey his commandments. You love him, he's Lord, well, you do what he says. Um, and, and that's what's on it here that Paul is on about. The evidence of God having worked in our lives is seen in our deeds. Easy, I mean, you can train a parrot to say Jesus is Lord. I've never tried it. I'm not going to waste my time in life trying that, but you can do that. You can train a parrot to, to come out with uh, a nice-sounding platitude, and you think, well, I've got a Christian parrot now. Jesus is Lord. Um, the evidence of God having worked in your life, opened your eyes, come into your heart to change your life, the evidence of that is in the way you conduct yourself, in your deeds. And so although it is true, as the scriptures and Paul himself would underline, it is true that the way that we are put right by God is, is not on the basis of our performance, not on the basis of our having been obedient, not on the basis of all that we have done. 
the evidence that we are saved will be seen in how we conduct ourselves. Paul himself will say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you, you've come to know him and uh, uh, become his, you've given your life to him and said, Jesus, I'm yours. Uh, take me. I, I need you to cleanse me. I need you to transform me. I need you to lead me, teach me, guide me, strengthen me, help me. And, and I've given myself to him. I'm in relation with him. I'm learning from him, being directed by him, being empowered by him. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature, a new person. The old has passed away, the new has come. And uh, the promise that God makes in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, is this. God says, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Um, so that's the evidence. The, the, the work of the spirit of God in you, who alone opened your eyes, enabled you to trust in Jesus, will be seen in a life that is moved by the Spirit of God to conform to, to delight in God's way of doing things. And, and that's on the day of judgment, that's the evidence that you are saved. Not, not that you profess faith in Jesus, because you can train a parrot to say the right things, not in terms of, of the service that you have rendered, but in terms of his being truly Lord, coming into your life by his spirit, living that life through you. And uh, that scene in verse uh, seven, he points to the way in which that finds effect in believers, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and who follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So you see verse 7, first of all, how that plays out in the life of those who have been wrought upon by the Spirit of God, um, that same Holy Spirit who uh, indwelt the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter speaks about Jesus in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and says, uh, you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good. So that when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon you as a believer, and that's the only way in which you become a believer, as the Spirit of God comes upon you, opens your eyes, enables you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that same Holy Spirit who then comes to live in you, that's what you find, a persistence in doing what he always does, which is doing good to those around. And that's what he's talking about here. Um, and uh, seeking the glory of God, seeking the honor uh, that God himself bestows upon his people and that immortality that is found in Jesus alone. Um, the persistence in doing good is the, the fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit. And conversely, verse uh, 8, uh, you see the, the flip side of that. Uh, however good they may be, uh, those who reject the truth, who are self-seeking, self-important, self-indulgent, self-righteous, oh. I'm okay because I'm, I'm a good sort of person and I, I pride myself in the fact that I'm not like this person over there or that person over there. I'm, I'm a kind of league above them and a league apart from them. That's self-seeking, rejecting the truth and doing, following evil. Not, not a, a nasty sort of evil always, but that evil which displaces God from his rightful place in our lives. So he's saying, uh, uh, five, don't think that uh, your upright living will see you through. Verse six to eight, don't think that the Lord is taken in by your professional piety. In verse nine to 11, he's saying, don't think that there are any exemptions either. And so he, he says, for all those, everyone must appear before the judgment seat of God there are no exemptions, no favorites, no distinctions that are made. God deals rightly with each and every one. That's the, the second of the headings. God's judgment is true. It's based on truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. It's right because it deals with rightly our conduct. And the evidence that our living is 
of the Spirit of God dwelling within us because we have opened our hearts to him and said, Jesus, I need you to come in. I need you to bring me that forgiveness and I need you to live my life through me because I, I, don't, I don't make the grade by myself. I need you to do that. And as he comes in by his spirit, there is increasingly that persistence in doing good, which is what characterized the Lord Jesus. And don't think there are any exemptions. Then um, the third heading, verses uh, 12 to 15, God's judgment is fear. He's addressing the question here that arises in people's minds. What about people, what about the person who's never heard of Jesus? I mean, you can hardly, you can hardly blame them for not trusting in Jesus when they haven't heard of Jesus. I mean, that, that's not fair, surely. Or uh, people who've never had the Bible. I mean, how are they to know? You, you can't kind of blame them uh, for conduct that they don't know anything about. So surely it, it's not fair. And that's what he's addressing in verse 12. Uh, all who sin apart from the law, that's to say they, they've never had a Bible, so they've never been exposed to what the Bible has to say. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. So verse 12, he's saying, don't think that you will be able to plead it's not fair. That's certainly one thing that no one will be able to say on the final day of judgment. No one will be left saying, hey, that's not fair. I had occasion as a parent in dealing with uh, one of the three boys to have one of the other sons come to me and say, dad, I think that was over the top. I don't think that was fair, that the punishment didn't kind of match the crime. And I had to recognize, yep, um, that, that was actually right. It, it was a little bit over the top. I'll not tell you what the punishment was, I won't tell you what the problem was, but it was um, that sort of thing. Um, we're born with this, this innate instinct for justice, fairness. And one thing that will never be said by anyone on the final day of judgment is it is not fair. It is totally fair. And what Paul is saying here, you will be judged against the light that you have received. So if you've never had a Bible, God's not going to blame you for never having a Bible. God's not going to blame you for the fact that uh, you, you'd never heard about uh, a guy, Nehemiah, or something like that because it's in the Bible. He's not going to pin you to the wall and say, you know, you, you, you never knew, you didn't even know Nehemiah. Uh, no, it's in the Bible. You, you don't have the Bible. He's, he's not going to blame you for that. If you have the Bible, then the light that you've received, it's, it's against the light that you've received that you will be judged. And the uh, response that he has to, to that is, is simply to say that's the basis, first of all, on which God's judgment is made. It's against the light that you've received. So when you are without the Bible um, and you sin, it's still a sin. But you'll be judged against that backdrop that, yeah, you, you don't have the Bible, but it's still sin. And you still perish. Not because you didn't know the Bible, but because you still sinned against the light that you received. So he then goes on in, in verse uh, 13 to say that don't think that quoting the Bible lets you off. Um, verse 13, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. He's, he's aware that for many of the Jews uh, in the congregation at Rome as elsewhere, their line was, hey, we're okay because God has made us his special people. God has favored us. God has favored us by giving to us the law. We've got the law. We, we know what the truth is. God has given us that. And Paul's saying, yeah, that, that's fine for you to know that, for you to hear that, for you to, to read that and study that, but um, that's, that's not really... Uh, the key thing, it's, it's are you going to do it? Um, that's, that's the thing. And sometimes people think that, you know, I've kind of got a shelf full of Bibles back home. It's there on the shelf and, and that'll kind of keep me safe in the day of judgment. I, I had a Bible. 
Um, sometimes people will say, you know, I, I, I love the Sermon on the Mount. You know, what, what fine teaching that is. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. I, I think Jesus bang on the button. What a great teacher he was, the Sermon on the Mount. I have a read of it. I, and I'm, I'm with him on that. And I think, well, you read it? Uh, because the Sermon on the Mount says, Jesus saying, be perfect. And, and people say, well, you know, I mean, nobody's perfect. And Jesus would say, exactly. That's your problem. No one is perfect. And he, and he lays it out and says, uh, you may think you, you've never committed murder, so you're okay because you've never done any dastardly deed like that. But he says, no, um, it's not just what you do outwardly. It's what you like inside. You, you ever called someone an idiot? I mean, cast your mind back. I'm not talking about just, you know, today already, but uh, past week past two weeks, past two years, past a lifetime? You never called anyone an idiot? You never, never thought to yourself, wish that person didn't exist. Ever said, I, I hate you under your breath? Jesus says, yeah, you've, you're kind of in the same bracket. It's not just what you do outwardly, it's what, what you like inside, the stuff inside that maybe never sees the light of day, but it's there, and it taints you, and it's out of line with, with God himself in, in all his purity. So I don't think that quoting the Bible lets you off. That's verse 13. And then verses 14 and 15. Uh, don't think that ignorance is bliss. Somebody, it's actually better if you didn't know the Bible. Better if you never heard of Jesus because then you wouldn't have to respond to him. And, and you kind of get off because you, you don't know. You never heard of Jesus, so I don't need to respond to Jesus. It would surely be better if, if none of us ever knew about him. And, and Paul knocks that one on the head and says, no, no. Um, the Gentiles, we'll read it, see what he says here, verses 14, 15. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience is also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. Um, what he's pointed to here is what he's already said in, in chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 19 where he said that, uh, that all that needs to be known about God has been made plain in them, not just to them, but in them, in conscience and in creation, that he is God. He does things well, he orders things well, and he means that our lives should indeed be lived under his lordship in a direct uh, line of, of what he has laid upon our hearts so that within our hearts, in our consciences, we, we kind of know what is right, and yet we still go against it. And, and what he's driving at here is that the judgment of God that is true, that is right, that is fair, is something that applies to everyone, no matter how good and upright they may be and how much they might resemble the oldest son who looks down uh, his nose at the youngest son, the prodigal says, that's a waster there. Even the oldest son is in need of forgiveness, cleansing, because there are things in that boy that are amiss as well. And therefore, he, he rounds off in verse 16 by simply saying that the judgment of God is sure. It is coming, verse 16, this will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Now, that's, that's something that you and I need to be clear about. It is true and it's based on the whole truth about you. You really think you measure up before Almighty God when he knows the secrets, the stuff that goes on internally, the stuff that you've done behind closed doors that no one else knows anything about. When that God knows it all, it's true and it's right. No exemptions. It's on the basis of that in your life which evidences 
his hand upon you, his grace towards you in Jesus Christ. And it's fear. There is that day coming. That's the world in which we live. There is a righteous God who made this world, a righteous God who runs this world, and a righteous God who one day will judge this world. Don't think that because it hasn't happened, and people have been on about this for long enough now, I mean, thousands of years, people have been saying there's a day of judgment coming. It doesn't look like it because uh, if there was a God, surely he would have stepped in long before now. Don't think that that's never going to happen. It is. This is a world that runs on moral grounds with a righteous God altogether pure. And that day will come. God has given proof of that. Paul declared to the people in Athens, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. People thought dead people don't rise. Never going to happen. It did. God raised Jesus from the dead. So don't think that when God says there will be a day of judgment, that's an idle, empty threat. It's not. It is the somber, sober reality. And he has demonstrated that that is and will be the case by raising his son Jesus from the dead. That's an historical fact, well-evidenced, so that you may look at it, examine it, ponder it for yourself, and see that the unthinkable did actually happen. God means what he says. And when you see that, that there will be, for definite, this judgment of God, there is true right and fear, then the whole burden of that message is to drive you to Jesus Christ and to see what God has provided for you in the face of your plight. You don't have a leg to stand on by yourself before Almighty God, no matter who you are. God has given you the legs to stand on in the person of his Son and bids you, no matter who you are, old, young, or good or bad, no matter who you are, bidden you to trust in him, look to him, lay hold of him, and receive what has been accomplished for you in him. May God enable us each so to do. Lord, uh, thank you for your word. Help us to take on board the challenge of your word. Sometimes we're inclined to think that we, we should just about scrape in because we're reasonably decent, upright, nice sort of people. Would you help us to see, living God, that before yourself, when everything is exposed, before your own all-seeing eye, all our attitudes, all our motives, all our thoughts, all our imaginings, all that goes on behind closed doors that we hope no one will ever see or know about. Would you help us, in the light of all of that, living God, to recognize afresh how altogether wonderful and altogether gracious and merciful has been your kind gift to us of your Son, in whom you provide for us a righteousness not our own. Help us, each one, to place our trust in him, 
as we ask it for his namesake. Amen. Well, as our closing praise, I thought we might sing uh, uh, an older hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Go then in peace to love and to serve the Lord, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.